Welcome back to another episode of Disruptors in a Culture, where we introduce you to creative disruptors that we feel like you should know. So Josh, uh, we have a repeat guest, or should I say a guest who's on prior with a lot of expansion and progress that's going on. And uh, Josh, you want to do the intro? Absolutely. Absolutely. So whenever we have Will Toms on the show, it feels like a family reunion. For those who don't know, Will is the visionary co-founder of Rec Philly, the number one resource for creatives. He's also the author of Uncommon Sense, Your Strategy Guide to Creative Freedom, a must read for anyone looking to monetize their creative pursuits. You also might recognize him from The Morning Coffee with Will Toms, where he shares invaluable insights and resources for the creative community. More recently, though, Will was featured on Culture Capital, an intimate discussion highlighting entrepreneurs of color who are making waves in their industries. And when he's not shaking up the creative world, you might find Will honing his tennis serve, recharging with loved ones, or pouring into those who pour into him. So it's always an honor to welcome back our dear friend, Will Tom, to Disruptors in the Culture. My man, Will, how you feeling, man? How you Yo, feeling? My people, first off, phenomenal intro. I appreciate that. That's a good job. That might as well just be my bio. Moving on, <laughs> moving forward. Um, but I'm feeling great, man. It's always it's always uh, a good job to get to talk to y'all. So thanks for having me. Perfect. All right. So the last time, you know, we we had you on Disruptors in a Culture, mm -hmm. um, you did a lot of talking about Reg. You know, as the co-founder, as the visionary behind it, of course, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was so much of your creative process, but. I we feel like you've been putting out your personal brand a lot more. So, you know, your growth into Will Toms and um, becoming a thought leader, or how, how can I say, like, I've known you for some years, so you were always a thought leader, but coming out from behind the company and really, mm -hmm. you know, sharing a lot of your, um, your personal mantras and ethos with everybody. So how, you know, what was, I guess, kind of like what was the catalyst or was it just mm -hmm. like a natural thing? Like, was that intentional for you to like kind of step out in front more? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good observation. Um, you know, I think a little bit of both was kind of organic just as I'm growing as a person, right. As a man, uh, as a creative, I think that's the, the nature of things. But then I think once that started organically, I, I realized the value of it. Right. So I started to, intentionally put myself in spaces and rooms and opportunities and positions to then really uh, develop it. So and so the reason why I think it all started is because, man, when it comes down to a pro, I'm a nerd at heart, you know, like I really am. I'm, I'm a nerd. I'm a builder, you know, and I think it was in my nature, especially early on as we were, you know, building the business and, and getting it to, to, you know, have its own legs, right? When I, we did um, the episode last time, pretty sure we had just recently opened the space, right? In, in Center City, Philly. Yeah. So it was kind of like, everything was about the business. So I think I was just way more comfortable kind of saying, don't look at me, look at the thing, right? And and I think as I, you know, got more comfortable in that, as the business started to mature, I recognized one, the power of actually being on the forefront and what that could do for the business. Um, but also, you know, I'm a creator, right? So I think rec is my main creation, but also there's been other things that I've wanted to create, other ideas I've wanted to share, um, which no longer felt appropriate to keep limited to just the container of rec. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, hmm. Any, I, you know, so like there's been the book, of course. Do you yeah. feel like, was, did it feel, do you feel, did you feel lighter? with like getting a lot of your practices and your thoughts out or like, how did that feel as far as like before and after? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny cause the book came first really is like a labor of love, you know, like it's not that I just saw myself as an author and was like, Oh man, I can't wait to write this book. It really wasn't that at all. I think it was, not I think I know the book really came to pass because I had that privilege of working closely with so many creatives. And um, I had noticed over a few years, there were so many creators that I got to talk to that were at different parts of their journey, whether they were kind of just getting their footing or they were Grammy nominated songwriters and producers, right? Or it didn't even matter what their creative background was, but I recognized I kept 
hearing a lot of the same questions. And for me, it was like, all right, well, selfishly, I just talked about this yesterday, right? So I got to the point where I was like, yo, to scale up my time, I should start documenting these ideas and be able to kind of just shoot those notes over to the next homie who asked me about how to build a powerful brand or what digital strategy should look like these days or how to build a marketing funnel. And um, over time, I realized that there was about 10 main ideas that I wished every creative knew, but most times we didn't. So that's actually where the, the a part of where that naming uncommon sense came from, right? It was everything I wish every creative knew. So, you know, I started to ask the homies as we would have conversations, yo, I'm down to, to rap, you pick my brain, but is it okay if I document this combo, right? And that's how the book came together. It was a series of conversations first that then I transcribed and then kind of completed some thoughts and polished it up, um, added some diagrams, some charts, some examples, and now it's 10 chapters, again, of those 10 ideas that I think are important. Uh, eight of the chapters uh, written by myself. And then the other two that kind of start talking about legal, how to protect your intellectual property and all that from my homie, who's who's a lawyer, uh, Esquire Carl Folks. Uh, shout out my man, Carl. Uh, he wrote the other two chapters about law. And um, that's how it came, you know, and I'm really grateful that it exists now because I did feel lighter on the other side because now I, I got an opportunity to kind of scale the impact up where it's like, yo, if you're a creative, you're turning this passion you have into a profitable business or that's your intention, I can literally just be like, here, start with this, you know, and it's literally a strategy guide and a blueprint for what that can look like. That's really interesting too. Like you even saying that where it's it's starting from conversations. So this was something mm -hmm. that organically came out. So how did you even take those conversations and start putting, I guess, like paper to pen or fingers to keyboard, mm -hmm. you know, to really kind of start constructing the book? Yeah. So the the process more tangibly was I would literally just record voice memos of the conversations. And then I would have someone help me. This is before AI where it was before where AI is now, yeah. I was like, yo, I had a homie, you know, who was like really interested in these conversations. He was like, yo, I'm willing to transcribe these for you. So he would actually transcribe the combos, you know, write them out. And then I would go back in and be like, all right, I actually meant to add this. I actually meant to add that. So I started to type it out and just give it some structure, right? Give it a, a, a more thorough outline. And I, I, I believe when I had maybe about five or six chapters, then I saw where the gaps were. I was like, wait, it's missing this part, right? We can't really talk about scaling up before we really talk about like finding product market fit, right? So let me add a bunch about that. And let me talk about what early adopters are, right? And how to get them excited. Um, so yeah, there was that. And then once I got to the point where I had the 10 chapters laid out, then it was like, okay, cool. Let's actually find an editor, you know, someone outside of myself who can come in objectively and, and be like, okay, is this coherent? Does it all flow in the way you think it does, Will? Like, and that was really cool. So there was a bit of a collaboration there, you know, brought Carl in to do his chapters. He knocked them out of the park with the quickness and um, yeah. And then it was time to go to publish, you know? So we self-published the book, which I also thought just made a lot of sense, right? The whole thing is about, you know, the independent grind and how to do it. So it felt appropriate to be able to just self-publish. Um, and for anyone who ever is aspiring to write a book, I, I really actually encourage people to self-publish the first one. And the main reason is if you do the publishing through someone else, or even if you just do Amazon KDP type vibe, you lose out because they don't share the data with you. You actually have no idea who's actually buying your book. So the reality is because we self-published, I have an opportunity to go and, you know, thousands of people have now purchased the book. And I have almost every single person's email and most of their phone numbers. So as I'm developing more things, I can just shoot them an, an email and say, oh, volume two just dropped. Or, hey, I have this event coming up. Or, hey, I'm actually opening up a coaching slot for next month. Um, and there's a lot of power in just knowing who's buying your stuff and why. Um, so, yeah, so we're really excited that the process went the way it did. Wow. That's really, um, wow. It, that reminded me of years ago years 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 ago um when you guys had the first i think right creative summit mm. and ryan leslie is a key um keynote speaker yeah he was talking about like what album sales and then you say well how do i tell the people that my next album's out and it's like y'all don't have the emails yeah so it's, it's kind of it's kind of crazy because i feel like um 
as I have so many questions off of that. My first question was like, oh, you found an editor. Like, did you use the rec <laughs> network to find an editor? Or <laughs> yeah. Yo, I, I did. I did, yo. Really? So so the cool thing is um, when you know so many talented creatives, like the, the, the resources are there, right? Um, so I actually found an editor. There was someone in the rec community who had already published a book. So I went right to him. I got Alex and I said, yo, I don't know what to do. This is my first time. Point me in the right direction. Uh, so he actually recommended me uh, to the editor that he had used on his his last book. Um, so, you know, she came through and it, it just there was a vibe. Right. Because like there's something to be said about um, it's almost like as an artist, if you're a musician, the relationship you have with your engineer is so important. Right. Because like that's the people you're going to be super vulnerable with. Right. Like they're going to be the they're going to hear the good stuff. They also going to hear the bad stuff. Right. So for the editor, for me, I needed there to be a real personal connection because she was about to see these things that I had been scribbling in my notebook and mm -hmm. all this and that. Uh, and also someone I needed someone who really understood the heart posture of like, yo, this thing is meant to serve creative. So like, don't be editing my voice and tone out. Right. Like like that's important to me. So when you read the book, like in my opinion, like it sounds like me and like. Yeah that's important. Right. So yeah, we, but we hit it off really quickly and, and she really, I think just did what was necessary to, to help me be my best self in the pages. And, um, yeah, a few thousand copies later. Um, I, I know so it's really helping people. Where can people buy it? Is this strictly through Amazon? Is it strictly through your website? Is it? Yeah. So the very best place for people to buy it is shop.recphilly.com, you know, buy it directly from us. And when you do that, it's still me fulfilling them, you know, uh, so I get a chance to write a personal note in there. You know what I'm saying? Throw some stickers in there. Uh, but yeah, shop.recphilly.com is, is the best place. It is still available through Amazon and some of those places as well, but come, come get it from the source. Do you think that, um, do you think the book was kind of the first, cause it felt like necessity, right? Like you said, like, instead of having to repeat the same conversations over and over, but also knowing that these are the most common things people don't know in ways that you could help them along their journey as you know it could have been like a cheat sheet uh, a blueprint that you probably like i wish i had this right so solving yeah. that problem of the because entrepreneurship and especially creative entrepreneurship is like this uncharted journey is is yep. not it's new especially even in like college majors and things right but do you yeah. think writing the book was your first was that like the first time that you kind of were like oh like find yourself really carving out your personal brand and like that set aside out set of, like a set aside thing because that yeah. was one of the first things that wasn't like presented by rec philly it was like no this is mm -hmm. will toms yeah i even put the middle name you know what i'm saying i put william tyrone toms on that thing. I know that's right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i think i think i think you're on to something there you know the book was the one of the first things where this was like yo, this is, this is me. This is something that I'm really offering, you know, from, from me, of course, like my team supported it, you know, and, and, and we're helpful. Um, but yeah, my name is on this and it, it meant a lot for me to, to put this out. Cause there's, um, I don't know, so many of us as creators, we know what it feels like to just have hard drives of ideas, right. And things that we want to share, but this was one of the first things where it's like, yeah, and this took, you know, I, I didn't say this, but this took like years to actually like put together. Like this wasn't like a three month project, like the, from the first thing ever written and the first conversations had to this actually being in someone else's hands, we're talking three and a half years, you know? So like, there was also just this emotional thing of just like, finally it's out. Right. Um, and it's done. Cause you know, I could have kept, tweaking and tweaking and tweaking and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, but this was one of the first soirees of just like, yo, this is, this is something I really deeply care about. And a part of my my desire for it to be out, outside of just scaling my own time and, and this and that is like, like you said, we don't have a blueprint for real, for real as creative entrepreneurs. And a lot of us spend a lot of time perfecting our craft and that's dope, but I think the tricky part though is like can you get as romantic and passionate about the marketing of your craft right like yeah. can you get as romantic and as exciting about having solid revenue streams and marketing funnels leading people to them right like and that's just something that sometimes we don't have and my my whole 
hunch from talking to thousands of creatives is we're actually not lazy as creatives. That's not the reason why most folks don't get to where they want to go. It's because we don't have the clarity of what are the actual tangible steps? What do I do next to be able to close that gap between where I am today and where I see myself five, 10 years out? And Uncommon Sense was really just meant to be a, a blueprint a blueprint and a roadmap to there to really just give you the foundational ideas of like, all right, what do I do next? And, uh, and if I skip steps, what do I need to go back and tidy up, right? And, um, and I'm really happy because I've seen people use it and, and really change their lives. Like I've seen, you know, my homie, Dr. Sheena Howard, you know, who's a phenomenal writer, you know, comic book writer, black woman from Philadelphia, writing comic books for DC comics, writing comics for Marvel, some of the best in the business. Yeah. But when she came to rec, she was still a teacher and, 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 and a professor because she couldn't really figure out the business of her writing, right? So the book didn't help her get better at writing, but what the book did do is it helped her understand the business side of her outlet. And last year we celebrated, it was our first year making six figures through her writing specifically. And when we talk about six figures, she probably wouldn't mind me sharing this, but she made over $200,000 right like so for for me to see that happen and she'll tell you yo the strategy's here you know like was the reason why um it's just exciting to give people that level of freedom right to 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 choose what it is that they do and get paid to be themselves yeah and sheena shout out to sheena she's brilliant like brilliant so brilliant and so brilliant but that is so hard for creatives figuring out that their revenue flow because everyone wants to use the creative to get mm -hmm. to you know do their thing and they just want to pay them the little salary when mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard because I think all of us, we go through that process where sometimes you're working this job and you're doing these creative things for them. And then you realize I could be doing this for myself. That's right. You know, right. whether it's building out your own thing and you're like, damn, like, I, yeah, they have the salary and they have the money, but sometimes they're hedging the bet that they're going to use it to get the money. Sometimes they don't even have the money right away. Cause sometimes I think that's the thing that deters us. Um, Wow. So, man, that's, that's like really incredible. So after the, okay, after the book, what, did you see like an influx of like speaking engagements? Like what, yeah. what was the most what tangible changed. thing return that you really yeah. saw outside of book sales itself that you saw come from the book itself? Yeah. Um, I think for me, the thing that comes right to mind is like, I think when you publish a book, there is a positioning shift, right? People really start to respect your authority in the space, you know? Um, and that led to some of the things you mentioned that led to more speaking engagement asks, you know, um, that led to, you know, more coaching clients, you know, I, I still, I just really, really have a passion for teaching. So like, I even still carve out time, you know, at least, you know, once a month to, to be able to coach creative entrepreneurs and give them that hands-on strategy. Um, and then, you know, there's other things that have started to happen after that, you know, features and documentaries and, and um, you know, things like culture capital that starts to bubble up. And I think that's just all a testament of what happens when you put your name out there. Right. You, you give yourself the, the willingness to be seen. There was a People show on Rio too, to right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did. I hosted, a, I hosted a show uh, called Generation Next on the Grio, which was really dope, you know, and really all I was doing was facilitating conversations with other creative entrepreneurs, artists like D Smoke or, you know, media personality, Scotty Beam or NFL, you know, defensive end Kayvon Thibodeau, right? Like these are just amazing people who have been able to turn their passion into, you know, successful careers and profitable businesses. Thing. And that's something to facilitating the conversations and the moderation. That's what you were doing for years mm -hmm. at Red, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it's, it's funny because it's like you just really put yourself out front. Um, yeah. Put your capital. It's on Peacock. Hold up. Before, before, we jump into that, before we jump into that, I just wanted to yeah. just give an extra shout out to the book. Hell I have yeah. to say that, Thank one, I read it earlier this year and was like, I, I made it a point because I was like, I want to really kind of sit down and think about, you know, how we can advance ourselves and like what will's also it was alluding to too it's really a workbook like yeah. not only is it there for you to kind of read and gain that knowledge but you mm -hmm. actually can fill out like the mm -hmm. thought processes go step by step like it's really like you're having a conversation with will as you're going through the book 
So I had my iPad out. I was taking my notes, writing down the every, every, like my personality, you know, how I can yeah. and turn these funnels into what we need for the company. And, and it really does help. So I, I, again, if you have not picked it up, please pick it up. It's a great tool for creatives. It's an amazing tool for creatives. Thank you. But Thank you brother. Again, sorry, Amir. <laughs> Go ahead. Nah, I, um, so culture creators, um, culture capital, culture capital, my bad. Yeah. I was yeah. like bringing my notes back up. Um, on Peacock right now is three yep. episodes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, really. I, I really like the way it's structured. I, um, I watched the first two, and okay, how did how did that opportunity or like how did how did it come about? Like, was there like an ask? Did they headhunt for people? Yeah. How did they like? How were you selected to be on the show? Yeah, I think I think that was a real headhunting situation. Um, from my understanding, you know, they scoured entrepreneurs nationally right for for this opportunity uh ultimately to choose nine you know entrepreneurs of color to tell the stories of um but i'm pretty sure there's hundreds if not thousands of people screened for that and um you know again we talk about that idea of you know the accountability of putting your name out there and, and really like standing on that um you start to be someone who's top of mind right when opportunities like that come up i always tell people like there's a such thing as creating your own luck you know when you can really um, work on something for a long time to the point where people know you for a thing, right? So I, I would like to believe that when people start thinking about creative entrepreneurship, they think about who's at the intersection of culture and economics, right? Like I think people think of me, which is a blessing. Um, so fortunately, I guess I was in the, I was on the brain of the folks over at Comcast and uh, Lift Labs when they were putting this together. And when I got to meet Sonia, the director of Culture Capital, um, you know, we had a really meaningful conversation. Definitely ran over the time <laughs> that we were allotted for that Zoom call. And um, yeah, there was just a real connection, right? Just like with the story and, and, and you know, she saw the vision. And um, yeah, it was just a vibe from there. So I'm sure it was a long process on the back end for them. But, you know, once I got to talk to their team, it all just kind of clicked and made sense. And, you know, some months later, you know, we're shooting and, we got done shooting in back in the fall and now it's just rolling out in the spring, you know? So like they took their time, you know, and really did it right. Seemed like they spared no expense, you know, when you see just like the visuals storytelling, right. Of the pieces, they snapped. And each story was told it very beautifully. Like they really did a good job mm-hmm. of like kind of laying it out and then breaking down the segments. You know, I think believe mm-hmm. it starts with like innovation and how yeah. each of the entrepreneurs kind of innovated their specific fields and kind of went into those topics. And then mm-hmm. um, I know I was telling Amir, you get around to episode two and we see a, f- a familiar face pop up talking about uh, hype, be, being hyper-focused in the community and really solving yeah. issues within your community and the yeah. birth of REC, which is really cool. And then I think yeah. like, so like you've been talking about getting a chance for your brand to kind of shine there as well and talking yeah. about your work within the community. What was that? Mm-hmm. Well, one, what was that experience like kind of telling it in that avenue and that in that medium um, that may yeah. be a little bit different than how you you know normally go about business? Yeah, it was interesting. You know, so the, the theme of the first episode was innovation. The theme of the second episode where we were spotlighted was brand. Mm-hmm. Right. So very connected to this whole conversation that we're having. Um, so it was cool to really highlight how, who I am, right. Um, and, and what I care about plays into what we built at rec, um, and how leveraging and understanding who you are in the power of brand can, can help things scale. Um, you know, it's so funny. Cause like, again, I'm, I'm a nerd. So I like to keep my head down and just like build and do the things. So it's always cool when like people care enough to want to come and tell the story from the outside looking in. Um, but I'll say this, like I, my whole idea was like, let me just show up and, and, and be me, <laughs> you know, and, and let them do what they do as far as telling the story. Um, so I'll say this, like, I thoroughly enjoyed the round table segments. Like, you know, there's like all the profiles, but then there's like the round table, all nine of us just got to really just talk about our journeys and all that. And what you may not notice is like, that was like hours of conversation mm. that they then were able to distill right into these like 30 minute episodes or whatever the runtime is. Um, but it was cool. There was just a real pure energy there. And I think one of the highlights of the whole process for me was the team, the crew that they selected. Like when you look at who was behind this thing, like everyone represents us 
And um, they created a certain level of safety for like, yo, we could just be us because we trust that the people who are, you know, stewarding these stories um, are going to steward it well, you know, and I think that comes across in like the the realness um, that people were sharing. When you think about, you know, my story, you think about Cody's story, right? Like they, they, they carried those and held those stories really well. And I think that came down to their selection of who they chose to be the storytellers, you know what I mean? Absolutely. I think, um, I, can you give us a little insight on some of those conversations? I guess I, I can only imagine the conversation between a bunch of entrepreneurs in a room talking about yeah. growth and, and, and your abilities and your, and the things you were going through during that time is, do you have any favorite moments or like favorite gems that you've taken away from the show? Mm, that's good. That's a good. Good question. You know, so again, nine entrepreneurs of color who are, you know, at the top of their industries in certain regards, but then also the host, who is Felicia Hatcher, right? Who, you know, is the CEO of Black Ambition Fund. That's Pharrell's, you know, investment fund, doing amazing work. She's also the the founder of Black Tech Week, right? And then sold it, her and her husband, to another Black couple who have been stewarding it since then. Like, yeah. so everybody at the table is hitters, and it's cool because like, there's such a nuanced experience that we have as as entrepreneurs of color. That's almost like a if you know, you know. And we got to just have conversations in that pocket, you know? Um, so just some of the the things that we got to jam on, it was just like, it felt like therapy a little bit, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> hearing people's stories about, you know, how they had to just finesse certain things because people on the other side of decision-making tables didn't quite understand, you know? So like we had to put it in language that they could understand and we had to, you know, just do the things that we do to get through. Um, so that was cool, you know, but also just recognizing all of our superpowers, you know, and, and how different all of our industries were to a certain extent, but how similar these experiences were like, you know, that kind of just blew my mind, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah, it was dope. I don't, I don't have a specific one, but like, I there's no, all right. So for me watching it, I mean, there were, yeah, there was like some really good standouts, like even, um, even though they didn't get granular into everyone's story, like the origin right. story, um, like Cody's beginning was like really strong as far as him, but he yeah. was like how he, how he was born. But yeah. you said one day, I was like, yep, that's Will. Cause everybody at the table was like, ooh. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it was episode one. And, um, yeah, I know and what you're talking, talking about. You're talking about, yeah, you're talking about you can't solve a problem Mm -hmm. with the same you know mindset or even being the same yeah. the same identity or same tactics that it took to create mm -hmm. it so that's yeah. why like founders of color are uniquely positioned to solve a yeah. lot of problems especially for things that don't serve everyone you know that's right we, we know it like a lot of times white people will say well i don't understand why this works and then there's millions yep. of people saying it does not work for us though you know that's so right. I think that yeah. was that was a real strong one that I think everybody was like, yes, that's really yeah, good. yeah, that's real because that was coming off of um, you know one of the founders was talking about how she had been counted out so much, right? And she's a woman, you know, been she's a scientist, right? Like she's out here creating chemical compounds in her garage to solve a problem that she cared about, but then she'd get on the line with like manufacturers and like. They'd hear her voice and be like, yo, let me talk to your boss. Like, cause as if like there was some man who was validating, you know, the things that she was saying. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I just, it resonated so much with me. Cause I'm like, yo, like there's all these people who in a way are a part of the problem, right? Cause they're the reason why these ideas that we have that are so innovative need to exist. And in the quote that I had shared was something to the effect of like, it's funny that all these reasons why they want to try to exclude us or invalidate us are the reasons why we actually are so well positioned to solve the problems at hand, because it's almost impossible to say to solve a problem with the same exact consciousness that created it. You know, like it requires a different a different thought pattern or a different heart posture in order to do the work. So, yeah, that was one of the moments. And in one way or another, every entrepreneur around that table had brought a different perspective or consciousness to an old problem. Yeah. Like baby's been been dying from from, you know, not being warm enough after birth for <laughs> ages, but she brought a different heart posture to it. You know, like my homie who started the the hip hop winery, 
people have been drinking wine forever, but like no one was thinking about the intersection of hip hop culture and wine, right? Boom, successful business. Or even just like, yo, the, the, the woman who built a company specifically to take care of our elderly and, and help them navigate the, the things that they need around the house because she know that her mama needed that stuff, right? And ain't nobody else going to take care of our, our elders, right? So it's just, yo, when we have such a connection to a problem, it's inevitable that we'll come up with the solution. And I think we're the ones who just are wild enough to believe that we can, can, can create it. That, you know, that was a that was a term you used a few times on the show, which, and I was like, ooh, I, I, I had never heard it before, was heart posture. Oh, and yeah. And so do you feel like, like I feel like your whole business model, your book, everything is always about helping people, helping people yeah. um, get the resources that they yeah. need, whether knowledge or whatever to get, was, was this always you? Like, is that how young Will was? Like, yeah. kid Will, teenage Will? For sure. For sure. If you ask my grandmother, like, that's just who I am. You know, I've always been, uh, I was raised to be a servant leader, you know? And like, when you think about servant leadership versus the traditional leadership, the only difference is the heart posture, right? Mm -hmm. Of why you do what you do. Cause like there's people out here who will do quote unquote good for people, but like, are you doing good for the right reasons though? You know? And I think that, you know, that's always just been who I am. And, you know, more recently that language of heart posture, you know, has really like connected with me and, and resonated. So I, I, think I like to use that term because I just think it's so much more clear and indicative of like what we're out here to do. Um, so, so yeah, but I, I'm, I'm that kid who grew up, you know, humble beginnings, but no matter what, I was still out there with my grandmother feeding the homeless, you know, cause she always wanted to remind me that there were people who, who, who had less than we did. And it was, you know, our responsibility to also care for them. And, um, you know, I think a part of my evolution just as a man on this journey, you know, is when you build something big, you also recognize that the thing you're building is also building you, mm. right? And we had a similar conversation on our last pod together um, around that. And I think that the business has really given me this opportunity to like grow myself in such a way that's allowed me to lean more into who I've always been, you know, as a young person and shed all of the things that I thought I had to be in order to build this successful business but realize that like, yo, the, all the magic is back at 10, 12 year old Will, you know? So you guys have probably seen in my journey, it's just more of that kind of coming to the fruition and to the forefront um, than any of the other things. Yeah, so I was crazy, um, man. Cause it, it, is, it reminds me like when I first met you um, when I was at the film commission and you were so in the back that it was almost like you didn't exist at, at REC. <laughs> <laughs> until I remember meeting you at I think the creative summit and was like yeah. so you're a part of Rec and you were like yeah I'm the founder and I'm like well why was it you at that meeting and you was like ah oh, strategy and I'm like man but it's but as to your conversation like on the show about your existence you being there how you do help yeah. move the conversation forward you help the younger you you know yeah. see someone doing the thing and saying oh that's attainable what would man you, what advice would you give child or teenage Will? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, there's so much, there's so much game I would give them. Uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind, if I was talking to 12 year old Will, I would say, you're already it, just be, you know? Mm -hmm. And the reason I would say that is because, you know, I think growing up, there was so much pressure to mold to what you think a successful entrepreneur looks like, you know, and you think that's the strategy to get there. Um, but that just lies, right? Um, so I think a lot of people need to hear that, especially young men, especially young men of color, right? Like. We grow up hearing, yo, expect to work twice as hard to get half as much, right? Like, yo, like, like all those things. So, yeah, I would just go back and just say, yo, like, you're already in. You, you just got to be it, you know? Um, and that's easier said than done, right? Because there's a lot of social pressures. Like, I was, I was literally that kid in the library growing up, like, 
reading was dope. And people were like, hey, you read books? <laughs> like, you know how yeah. Philly is. So <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, so yeah, but, but yeah, I would just say, yo, you're already it. And I think there's just a whole world out here that tries to convince us that we're not, and then tries to get us chasing all the wrong things. I love that too, man. I really do feel like, um, one of the things I had in the docket, I was like, whenever we bring up Will, I feel like he's a creative cornerstone for the city of Philadelphia on so many levels. Okay. Like not a, not just through Thank rec, you. but you as a person. Somebody comes to you like, hey, can you connect me with so-and-so? Like you very much do that. But when you talk about the representation that you are for, I feel like black men of color within the city as well, I think you, you bear that flag too. Like you, I think you show a lot of people that, you know, one, something like this is possible. Um, you show the kids from where you're from, like, hey, this is also possible. Like, you can be from where I'm from. You can be from Germantown and be able to do X, Y, and Z. So I think, you know, you definitely give yourself some credit there as well. Um, you. Have you seen that impact from the uh, the youth who look at you now and say, okay, <laughs> Will Tom, he's that guy. I want to be like that. Yeah. You, do you see that at all in their eyes? Man, first, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, I see it, bro. I see it. And, and it's, it's a joyful feeling because, you know, I really just believe it's incredibly hard to be what you can't see, you know, and, and I, for some reason, not even for some reason, I know why, but unfortunately, a lot of dope black men who could be great role models, they shy away from that responsibility. You know, they don't want to be held accountable to being a role model. They don't want to actually like have people look at them and follow the path. Right. Um, and that's sad, you know, so for me, like, I, I'm like, okay, cool. I want to live in a, in such a way that I'd be a positive influence to other people. And when I started to see that happen, it, it's shown up in, in different ways. You know, it's always, it's always, um, moving for me, you know, because I'm like, you know, I had this conversation with my man, Leonzo, um, and, and he and I, we go way back to high school. Um, but we had this conversation, uh, just a couple of years ago where we were like, yo, like, how crazy is it that we both got to be like men that we needed when we were younger, mm. right? Like we actually became the people that we needed when we were younger and did not have. Cause like, I didn't have anyone in my family that was doing cool stuff and hard of service, building million dollar businesses. So the fact that like our role models were on TV, but somehow we were able to pull that into reality is is super cool because now there's there's young people around us who actually get to talk to us and, and and be around and can ask questions uh so i just get excited for like the greatness that they'll be able to to take the baton and run towards you know um but yeah i'm really grateful for that i will say this though josh i think the role model stuff so far is only the tip of the iceberg because I believe that this next chapter that God is calling me to is like really where the impact is going to come from, you know, mm -hmm. just as far as just the things that I feel called to share. Cause like, yeah, I'm a share of the Forbes 30 under 30 and I'm gonna share this business accomplishment and stuff. But like, I'm really happy that I got a chance to share my baptism. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and normalize that, make that fly. Like mm -hmm. I just got engaged. I'm, I'm happy to be going to this next season of my life and, and being a proud family man. Right. Like, and I think that's just as important. Like I recognize that like when I was coming up, man, the, what was most important to me and what my chief aim was, was like, I'm breaking this generational pa pattern of poverty in my family. But like, it took me even longer to recognize that that's dope and important. But before that, you should break the generational pattern of not being married in, in, in a healthy relationship, yeah. you know? And if you get that right, it's probably going to set you up to be able to break the other one of generational wealth. You know what I'm saying? So like, yeah, man, I'm just really excited. And um, I'm grateful that God's put me in position to be a role model. We need them out here. We do. Sure. And the transparency and the communication for mental health for everybody. Is very yes, much sir. Important. But we need that transparency. We need that communication. And I, I can't stress. We, we're talking about it before we started recording. Like, you know, we need that male group chat. Like, hey, y'all, this is what life is like. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's needed. It's needed. And I'm, I'm so happy that, and I you know, think, you're embracing that. I think it's a conversation that women have been talking about. Since women entered, were able to enter the workforce, there's always been a conversation of juggling family and career and how to show up for your mm -hmm. family and how to also be a present partner, right? And I think you guys, by like, you by example, are helping show to helping people to see you know men trying to figure that out because for so long it was acceptable for men to just be workers yes. provide yes. 
go home. Look, it was married with children. You come home, sit on the couch, just there. You know what I mean? Where's my beer? Where's my food? Kids, get out of here. You know, you need some money. Yeah. Like that yeah. whole intro to, to love, married with children is that they get the money there. You know, it's, yeah. that was kind of seen as like, oh, this is being macho. Where yeah. um, that that being heart more heart led um, in your example mm -hmm. is is really is really strong. You know, and it's like, and I saw that you got baptized. I said, oh, you're a believer. It's like leading with your, like, your Christ consciousness of just like, yeah. listen, we, I can do yeah. all things and be a good person and or, or strive to be a good person, should I say, because, you know, mm -hmm. good people don't show up in one, one way, but you're just like sure. trying to, but you're, you're, that's, that's who you are though. You're helpful. You're helping people figure it out, you know? Um, hmm. So. <laughs> With that, like you, it's like okay. Let me, I'm trying to look at the next question. Yeah, I was like, like we, we deep now. <laughs> it's cool. I can swim. <laughs> oh, yeah, because it's like okay, and then tennis. Like you've always played tennis, though, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. Again, yo, all these things. Like I didn't just now become a believer. I, I grew up in the church. Yeah. I was just lukewarm. <laughs> you know what right? I'm saying? <laughs> so, so for me, the baptism was really just like me outwardly, you know, professing what I feel God has done for me internally for these last like nine, 12 months, you know, and brought yeah. me back. Cause you know, I was always, you know, always believe in God. I always knew Christ was it, but like, I just wasn't walking sturdy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like even uh, going back and recharging yourself. Like you, you, you had the ability to one tap back into your roots, tap back into the church, tap back into tennis. For those who right. don't know, what is, what is your tennis experience? Give us, give us the, yeah. give us the athletic resume. Let's go. Yeah, man. So I ran, I, I ran into the sport of tennis in gym class, you know, on some random when I was in like ninth grade and then fell in love with it, man. Mm -hmm. You know, my gym teacher was like, yo, you, you kind of all right at tennis. Like you should try out. And then I actually ended up playing, you know, varsity tennis all throughout high school. Um, you know, won some USTA tournaments, you know, did that whole thing. And then went off to college and it wasn't flying. I definitely wasn't trying to play no real sport in college josh you know how much of a commitment that is yeah. uh, and i had found cameras at that point so i was doing all sorts of cool creative stuff um but i stopped playing tennis for a long long time and then um my homie miyako asked me a couple years ago he was like yo will you teach me how to play and um i was like yeah so we started playing you know every other every sunday for about a year and then i would randomly put it on my story that we were hitting and before I knew it, so many people were DMing me and be like, yo, you hit, yo, let's play. And I guess me just being the community builder I am, now we have a group chat of like 50 people, you know? So now anytime somebody wants to play, there's always people who are willing. So yeah, man, that's been a, a, just a real essence of me getting back to teenage will. And, you know, that's one of the spaces in my life where I really can like turn my brain off and just focus on the ball, you know, and one point at a time, you know, and, uh, yeah, something unders for me. My man kept it real too. He had the he had the tennis videos with the knee brace on too. I was oh, like, yeah. I saw that. I was like, oh, that's oh, yeah. the honesty we all need. I was like, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> like, thirty year old no. life, we need those <laughs> facts. Yo, after thirty is different, bro. <laughs> so with um with juggling at all, right? Family, yeah. like or building now, family. You guys are about to go. Like, bro, you just got engaged. Like, so now it's about to be planning a wedding. Yeah, and all the things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, look weddings are whoa that's a, that's an undertaking in like the scale but i mean you've scaled multi-million dollar businesses so that shouldn't be too bad right um is there anything like that's been making your life easier like as far as in um juggling it all whether it's in work mm -hmm. whether it's at home i don't know like a software a tool uh anything a practice like you know something new or old that's like like that's what you lean on to help make your life a little easier I mean, the first thing, I'll give you a tangible uh, app and all that stuff too, but like this tool, this is my, my weapon right here, what you mean? Um, you know, not to, 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 to over, you know, belabor the point, but like, I feel like me just being back in the word has really relieved the pressure from so much of what it means to be an entrepreneur at a high level. Um, you know, it just put everything back in its proper place. And it's like, yo, if I'm centered, if I'm, you know, submitted and, and, and where I'm supposed to be, the things is going to come, you know, the seek ye first the kingdom and the rest will be added, not chase all the rest, <laughs> you know, and go from there. So that's really like 
given me such a peace because like y'all know y'all don't see me like in parts yeah. of in certain seasons of the journey i would be doing it but i was also pretty stressed <laughs> like yeah. you know what i'm saying like i'm also like ah. um so there's been such a profound peace you know that i've been able to hold everything with and just knowing like you know god's gonna provide we're, we're more in like a steering phase of the journey than we are in a build momentum phase Absolutely. right and it's like and once you get to a phase like where we are where momentum is built you need the discernment to properly steer the thing yeah you know and i think that's what what my faith has really provided um so that's one of the tools yeah. um if i had to give another one I'll say two. I gotta can't not say Chat GPT, mm. like for real. And like I think there's like certain people who like using it, but I think there's most of us as creatives who still don't use it. And I think for any creative who's like trying to put out output at any kind of pace, if you're not using Chat GPT on a weekly basis, you're you're just playing yourself, you know. Um, so I, I appreciate using that for different sorts of writings, um, you know, for brainstorming, for research, to like gather insight and then go and dig deeper. Chat, so chat GPT is fire. Um, and then recently somebody put me on a notion. Mm. So I've been using notion. Um, mm. so that's been really helpful and I'm not like the most organized in that manner, but notion has been really helpful. Um, yeah, those are the top of mind tools. Those are great tools, to be honest with you. Um, I love the one rooted in Christ, first and foremost. That's like yes, huge sir. major. Anything you can't do anything without him. That's like yes, the rule number one. At least not well for yeah. a long period of time. <laughs> it'll, it'll fall apart. <laughs> it'll definitely you know? fall apart. But yeah. Notion, I'm happy you brought up Notion. Uh Notion's a great tool, and I'm happy more people are finding out about it. The pages, you can build whole websites on that bad boy. Um but wow. we had a whole we well when the rest of our podcast RSS feeds get fixed, you'll hear our episode about AI and chat GPT and just its nice. space in the creative and how definitely creatives are kind of like half trusting it, half not just because, yeah. you know, sometimes like even when I think we had made it, I made it in my last intro on there, right? Amira. And it came yeah. out a little bit too wordy. It didn't, it didn't have the soul. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. it's definitely some tweaking you got to do, but it's, it's, it's a great, it's a great tool. It's, man, it's yeah. great for people like me, man, who struggle with, uh, executive functioning and just getting things started or switching tasks and the getting yeah. started and me say look you give me a write this about this and mm -hmm. that and that and then i can yeah. edit it away but it helps that blank page sometimes boy, boy that's it yeah that's it nothing more intimidating than the blank page you know so to be able to just get in there and and, and get the ideas out and then let it just okay cool here's a bunch of stuff to work with right yeah. Like I always tell my friends, like, don't fear AI as if like AI is going to replace you. Who will replace you is another creative who leverages AI. So yeah, <laughs> you choose, you know, because yeah. it's not going to go away. And, and there's just such a productivity hack, you know, that's available to you if you're willing to embrace it. So we're, um, back to the show, like. Was there anything that you learned from the other entrepreneurs? Because that was was that a one day sit down? Because they really did do their thing. Like yeah. the familiar faces I saw, like when they cut to wreck, and mm. I was like, oh, they came to Philly and they did be raw. Mm. Said, oh, look yeah. at them and look at the team and yeah. look at the folks. Like, yeah. Yeah. but was yeah, there like said. some stuff you really learned from them, like the other mm. entrepreneurs in the room? Let me see. I mean, yeah, I, I learned a ton. I mean. <sighs> I was really inspired by Cody, yeah, you know, strong, crazy, like Cody's story. I hope what, what I hope people take away is you can start from anywhere. Literally, it's like funny. we all got stories, but it's like my man was literally born in prison. His mom was chained to a bed. You know what I'm saying? Like. And then he went to what I forget MIT or Stanford, and then you know is building an AI company and going crazy. Like, so it, it just shows you like, you know, the circumstances matter way less than we really, you know. Um, 
so so I, I, that's what I took away from him. Um, what else? I mean, here, let me let me let me let me do this real quick. I would say this. Um, I learned a lot from Grace as well. Grace is the woman who built the biomedical blankets mm-hmm. for the babies. And what I learned from Grace goes back to the thing I told you I would tell my younger self. Grace has such a bubbly spirit, like high energy, quirky, weird. And that is her. Like who came across on the camera is like her 24 seven. And um, it just reminds you, yo, that like everyone's superpower is to be unapologetic, unapologetically them. And like anything you let take you away from that is you just giving your power away. And I think she's just a good example of that. So she reminded me of that, just like seeing her navigate that space. Um, she just plays big, you know, and whatever that looks like for her. Um, who else? Like I could probably find a good lesson from everybody. But yeah, those were my two. Cody Cody, and, and Grace really were, were standouts for me. And I think they were, those were very strong stories. I think Cody was the first episode, of, uh, not episode, first uh, story on episode <laughs> one. That's right. Powerful. If you have not watched it, please watch it on Peacock Culture uh, Capital. It is, yeah. it is so, very, very good. so, so good. Um, very good. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like not, this, I'm, I'm interested. I know this is our, 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 our main question, but we've seen, again, from the growth that we've seen from you, um, mm-hmm. I know last time we had asked you to pick an album or a song or a mixtape that describes where you are in life. Um, cool. Where are you at in life now? And why? And what album, song, or mixtape would that be for you? Opens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me let me just get a quick scroll. Man, this is this is such a good question, and I should have been prepared for this one. But I'm not, <laughs> you so knew it was just, coming. <laughs> I know. I know. Man, where am I at? I can start there. Um, I feel like right now. I'm just in such a submitted place, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I think for a lot of my journey up until this point, I've been like sprinting, you know, and like so clear, cause I'm a very intentional person. That's just who I am. Like I, I'm visionary, I see it and I just want to sprint there. Um, but I feel like God has just had me in such a submitted place and almost a reminder of just like how much more is possible from that heart posture, <laughs> you know, of submission. And um, yeah, I've just been leaning into that. And there's been a lot of fruit because of it. So if I had to give an album to kind of encapsulate that, my favorite album right now is uh, Amen by an artist named Sande, S-O-N-D-A-E. Um, I got hip to them probably about two years ago. And when I tell you that album has probably gone platinum on my phone alone, <laughs> uh, it's really one of them. So yeah, he's got a song called Holy Essence on there. And then it just proceeds to be a no skip for me. So I hit the Apple music, I mean, Apple music search. <laughs> hit it up, hit it up. It's a good John. Um, and then also, I don't know if y'all remember, but we talked about how much of a nerd I am. So I listen to pretty much the same playlist almost every morning. Um, that is still me. And that playlist has evolved and developed since yeah. uh, we've last talked. So if you want Apple Music, look me up. You'll see my playlist. Oh, word. Do oh, you start it up. from the top or you just pick it up where you left shuffle. off? The shuffle. I shuffle it. Word. Yeah. So it's always the same songs, but it's probably like three hours of songs at this point. So it's a fresh flow, but it's always the same energy, you know, which is which is what it is for me. Man, so. good stuff. So yeah. Here, where you are right now. I guess what's what's like, all right, so if you could sit down with one person, you know, everyone always says that anywhere in the world, yeah. um, what, what do we have here? What does this say? Hmm. For one, for one hour. Oh, the screen not wide enough. Let's see this <laughs> out. For one hour. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Get an hour? Oh, yeah, an one hour. hour. Who would it be and why? I feel like if you had a, as much time as you wanted, you know, you can do whatever you want. But if you only got an hour time. One hour. So what are we talking, dead or alive? Or are we talking just now? Dead or alive, anybody in the world. Sheesh. He's going to so say broad. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's like you know. people say either Jesus Christ. I mean, most people you would say Jesus Christ, Martin Luther King, you know, some of the like the old Bob Marley. Yeah. I want to know dead or alive, and then I want to know straight up alive. Alive. Okay. Let's just do it alive then. Let's do it alive. No, no, okay. we could do dead or oh, alive. No, both. we could do you both. Do both. All right, do both. Yeah. Do both. You know, that's a good one. Huh. Honestly, if I could do dead or alive right now, like obviously, let's just take Jesus out of it because, like, that would be great. But, That'd be crazy. But, 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 that would be great. I feel, like, but like, I, I, that, I feel you. I feel you. That would be lit, but I feel like that's like an easy one, right? But honestly, even more exciting than that, I would want to talk to like Matthew or John or one of them bulls and be like, give me your perspective. Let's have a real chat of yeah. what it looked like to be a follower then, right? Like I feel like there's so much we can glean from 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 that perspective. Yeah. Um so I just have like minute, when you saying that the, um and I, the book of Clarence how yeah. they how the yeah. apostles were depicted in the book of Clarence I thought mm. that was like I mean the disciples were de- depicted yeah. was perfect that was like yeah. cuz if you read if you when you read the book and you really kind of like they all were not great people <laughs> none of them were right. great people yeah. but they were called to follow and I really feel like in that book I'm at the book in the movie he they yeah. did an amazing job just making them humans who were just following Jesus who we're a bunch of sinners, so it was it was, it was cool. It was cool. Sorry, yeah. I mean, I I'm having watched it because I haven't still. Oh, yeah, I know, but yeah. And in the book, and in the book, Paul, man, like he was a wild boy. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And then went to went on to write like I don't know something like two thirds of the New Testament, right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. so it shows like, I gotta use anybody, but I think there's something to be said about the courage that those dudes had, right? To 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 be followers, right? I think we glorify the leaders as we should. But there's yeah. also something to be said about the people who are willing to be like, yo, I see the greatness here. And even if persecution is here, I'm still going to tell the truth. You know, I'm really inspired by that. Um, and then I have to just say honorable mention, like, I'm just in such a family mode right now that I am super interested in, like, what it would look like to sit down with, like, my great, great grandfather mm-hmm. and just have a real chat about, like, what his life is like you know, in his maybe, let's say when he was my age. Um, Cause one, I think there's just immense amount of gratitude I'd, I'd gain, um, but then also I'd, I'd be really excited to like give him the moment to be able to see like what he's enabled, right? Cause I don't know him, I don't know Bull, don't even know his name and that's a shame. Um, but, but I would really be interested cause I'm at a part of my journey where like legacy is really top of mind for me. And like, I get excited by stuff like, I can't wait to, build a house and plant a tree that I know that I'm never going to see it actually get to like full fruition of, but I know my great, 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 great grandkids is going to be able to look and see a fly video of their great, 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 great grandfather and be like, he planted this tree, you know? Um, so I think it would be fly to have that conversation with that bull that I do not know. Yeah. So I'd say, I'd say that's who dead. Alive, man, who do I want to talk to alive? <laughs> That's tough. That's super tough. Uh, <laughs> oh man, I had a crazy one. I would, I really want, oh man, somebody might try to kill me for this. I really want to have a conversation with Thomas Sowell. You guys know who Thomas Sowell is? No. No? All right, just after this, go do your Googles. Thomas Sowell, S-O-W-E-L-L. Um, he's a economist, philosopher, thinker. Um, he has some really interesting, uh, ideas just around economics, black people policies, him and Claude Anderson typically, uh, come up in conversations mm. together. Um, but yeah, I would like to have a conversation with him because he's, he's a wild boy <laughs> and really smart guy. And I want to learn from him. Okay. I'm going to do my, well, he a brother. Things. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Like, okay, for sure. Basic. Y'all gotta circle back after y'all like watch a video or something. You gotta circle back and text yeah. me and be like, "You about to get a text like, okay?" <laughs> Listen, he's written a lot of books. Yeah. Y'all gonna he be has. Book on that. Yeah, I'm in '94. Yeah, I've seen a lot so, of things too. The fact that he's still here. Yeah, '94 came up in uh, Harlem. Wow. Oh yeah. <clears throat> yeah. This sounds special about Harlem. Mm-hmm. I used to live there, and it's just like. 
it's it's the thought of like yeah harlem's a neighborhood but they try to treat it as a borough because it's been so historically black mm. but wow. i live in manhattan you know what i mean and they're like well where do you yeah. live i'm manhattan and they're like where and they're like harlem they're like well that's not manhattan yes it is you know what oh, i mean interesting and, i see and so it's like you know you're like a short train ride to everywhere in manhattan for the most part mm -hmm. but also just it's just like you're right there you know what i mean yeah. that i i was living there 2010 to 2012 so you're talking gentrified almost yeah. not like it is today yeah. but pretty gentrified and stuff but i just feel like man harlem people from harlem they be they be on top of they be on top of game they, i believe it yeah I mean, it's, it's just every, everyone i know that's like from harlem in my mind it, it just has such a big energy to them yes. whether it's dapper dan or dame dash right like yep. it seems like the harlem energy is such a bold or die <laughs> kind of energy yeah. It's, it yeah. is. It's bold. It's yeah. big, except Rocky, the whole crew. Like, it's mm -hmm. just, yeah. And I, and I wonder if it's, it might be an excess thing because you're right there. Like, we, I would, my friends would come to town. I'd be like, all right, let's go hang out. Let's go have lunch. And we go into Soho. We go, on, like, it mm -hmm. didn't feel so, we felt like that's our backyard in a sense. Like, yeah. and also the history, right? Like, the Harlem Renaissance. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I think standing on the shoulders of those dudes that flavor like those are the great grandparents of some of those people i just mentioned right so like yeah. i think they normalize a lot of that trendsetter energy that mm -hmm. unapologetic expression you know harlem people fly. even kelly from harlem mm -hmm. Word. Okay. um Word. so we got we got winter uh, yeah i'm yeah they got it first somebody gifted it to her it's like the African American ABCs, where it goes mm. through the alphabet, but goes through it from like like D is for diaspora, um, A is for the a banner of song. So I, I, I've fire. read it fifty times, so I think I know the I know a lot of it. But there's a there's a I think H is for Harlem and talk about the Harlem Renaissance. And wow, also, you know the impact that it had on the Black community and really kind of the birthplace of all the creativity. So you that's know, powerful. Like I was saying Harlem is strong. Harlem is very strong. That's powerful. So that's dope. for your um, then to now like. Uh, I guess from last time we were talking, uh, damn, when was it? That was 2019, was it? Yeah, no, 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 it was 2020, but was it before the pandemic? I, I think. think it was right before the pandemic. I think it was, and just like how much has changed. But overall, through your journey, wow. has your ultimate goal like in life changed, like of what you're doing? And um, because mm. I mean, you, you were talking about, um, yeah. you know what well, you keep saying heart i don't know i keep wanting to say heart led but you're saying like your heart, heart posture your heart mm -hmm. posture it mm -hmm. has your why become different or you know like your overall goal mm -hmm. that's a beautiful question um it has it has and i and i guess um i'll say this like i don't know if the why has changed, but I think what it all will look like, right? When the story is written, you know, um, I think that desire has changed. Um, you know, I don't know quite how I want to articulate that yet, but there's there's a there's a shift happening, you know, and uh, I'm really grateful for it. And I think the most exciting thing is I think all the things that I feel like God had placed on my heart then will still come, can still come to pass. But I think like, again, just me understanding the importance of just getting back to my essence, seeking the kingdom first, like that is, is really my desire right now. My desire is just chase the kingdom, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I know in doing that, everything else is, is on the table to be had, you know? And I think even some of the more difficult parts of my journey and the roller coaster, right, since 2020 till now, which is nuts. Um, mm -hmm. It just came from, it just came from misplaced desire, you know, some of the challenges for real, for real, you know? So I think now that I'm beginning to get some of those things out of the way, you know, I get excited for, you know, how the rest gets to unfold now. When you, so, when, when you say misplaced desire, is anything like you could drill down, like even expressing like what some of those desires maybe were as far as in, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to do that. So, you know, one of my, one of my um, favorite thinkers is a guy named Naval. Um, also someone you guys should check out if you're not familiar, Naval Ravikant. 
he has a quote that really punched me in the chest the first time I read it. And the quote says, um, desire is a contract you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get the thing you want. And um, for me, I just had to recognize that like, I had so much desire for what the, what I wanted the business to do tangibly that it was taking the pole position in my life. And that's just not a good place for that desire. It's not that like, that's not an okay desire to have, yeah. but like anything out of order is, is, is gets misused. You know what I'm saying? Or you'll like abuse yourself to, to try to make it work. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that that's just shifted for me, you know, and it's not that like, I don't still work extremely hard and it's not that I don't still like go and get it. Um, but putting all the things in their proper place, right. Has allowed me to just, again, have a different energy towards it a different level of attachment or detachment from the thing um which allows me to attract things better right i'm not chasing mm -hmm. things i'm not a position mm -hmm. for you know um so so yeah you know still want to continue to empower creatives still want to you know be the number one resource through through the platform that is rec but i also am submitted to you know god using me in whatever other ways you know that, that he sees fit so doing that and, and really um, getting to build my family in the way that I know deserves to be built, you know, those things take precedence. And I have a wild hunch that getting to do that, all the rest is going to be added, you know. So, yeah, I, I hope I answered your question. No, you did. Because it, um, and it's funny because like we, even we came on you like nice shirts, Nipsey Hussle's birthday. But yeah, shut up, Nip. I remember he made a comment before about um when you have other ways or avenues, well, he was more talking about, you know, other ways to make revenue, make money. You mm -hmm. take the desperation off your art to make it right. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. pressure on something does create a level of desperation, pressure to make something reach a goal. You know, it has mm -hmm. to reach this goal and that obsession. It can add mm -hmm. a level of desperation in where you neglect everything else to get that. Mm -hmm. But like you said, so it, it makes perfect sense in a, like a cyclical way of like, maybe this company doesn't scale to this number in five years. Maybe it takes 10 to get there, but on a path, all these great things happen for Will and Dave and all the rest of the company. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, I, I feel like that desire, desire can become obsession. Oof. Oh, for sure. And I was, I was obsessed. <laughs> I was optimizing everything, um, you know, in, in, in pursuit, you know, and, and I think to everything a season, right? Like, I think there's something positive about the level of focus and, you know, resilience and drive, you know, that we commit to the business. Um, but again, we're not in build momentum season anymore. You know, the, yeah. the thing is not the, the, the infant that it used to be, right? It's getting to a point where it's got some sturdy legs, it, it grew some kneecaps, right? And it's, it's kind of starting to walk on its own, you know? Um, so we have a different role. Don't mean that we don't need to still be great parents, but what that looks like changes. And um, I'm grateful that now, again, as the business has grown up and matured, it's also allowed me to grow up and mature, you know? Um, and I get to be a whole person, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Uh, so yeah, I'm really grateful for that. That's powerful. You're already using the uh, the parent lingo here. <laughs> it's got new cats <laughs> walking. I was like, wow. <laughs> yes, I feel that. Man. I feel that. And um, yeah, I think the I know we 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 hitting our time, but we want to make sure that we always have to ask you, um, like Amir had said, from then to now, what does being a disruptor mean to you now? In this season, yeah, this, for yeah, you, this season you for being you. a disruptor, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah, not rep, you. Of course, of course. Uh, man, what, what being a disruptor means to me right now, um, you know, in the spirit of this conversation, you know, being a disruptor means, sheesh, well, let me see what that, I love, I love that question. And I have to also go back and watch what I said before. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, I think for me, specifically with the lens of the culture, right? I think being a, a disruptor means being whole. Mm. You know, I think if I could give something to the culture, 
that I think it so desperately needs is a spirit of wholeness, you know? Um, so I'm on, I'm on that path to disrupt it in that way, you know? So I'm gonna start, start, start at home, you know what I'm saying? And, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of good fruit that comes from that. And, um, yeah, be a whole value principled person. And I think most great disruption can come from that place. if You do it right. So yeah, being, being courageous enough to get whole. I like that, man. I like that. All right. Okay. Where can people follow you and keep up with your work? Will? let them, let the people know where they can get, they can, they can follow the brand. Yeah, follow it. Follow the brand. Um, you can follow me on Instagram and most of the other platforms too. At the Will Toms, T H E Will uh, T O M S is the last name. And um, yeah, I got to just you know shout out that a lot of cool things coming this fall. Uh, morning coffee, uh, my my weekly live stream show is coming back. Also developing a really fire newsletter that everyone should subscribe to so you can do that by going to joinrec.com and going ahead and dropping that email in and we just gonna be sending fire to your inbox on the weekly basis and that's gonna be super cool so i'm really excited about that um but yeah follow me on the social medias and i'll keep talking about what we're doing building it in public with a level of vulnerability and uh excitement that i think will be valuable for people so i'll let you boy Absolutely. Well, Will, yeah. again, this is a family reunion. It feels like literally a family reunion yeah. every time we talk, man. You're always inspirational. We, we love the energy. <laughs> and I, I really hope you get just as much out of these conversations as we do. And I hope our listeners do as well. Yeah, I sure do, man. I appreciate you guys having me uh, once again. And uh, yeah, keep doing this, y'all. These are fire. Man, we appreciate you. Um, for everyone who's tuned in or listening, um, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe this episode because it can and will help a creative in your life. And mm -hmm. that creative may be you and maybe someone else, but please, it also helps us as creatives for us getting our mission out there and to show that we have a subscriber base so that we can go and get some coin, okay? So like, share, and subscribe. Will, once again, we thank you for being here with us and um, sharing all your gems and your journey with our audience. For everyone, please, thank you for tuning in. You could have been anywhere listening to anything. And please join us for our next episode. Have a great day. See y'all. Peace.